My lab works on uh, all sorts of different problems in microbiology, but the central theme that runs through everything we do is protein DNA interactions. Uh, and that's really what I first started uh, working in the lab doing as an undergraduate. So, the, so at the moment, there are three main research themes in the lab. Uh, so there's kind of the, the basic science research theme, which is essentially just understanding how genes work, how genes are controlled, how protein DNA interactions play a role in controlling genes, uh, and just really understanding the fundamentals and the basic principles of gene regulation. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we're interested in pathogenic bacteria uh, and the role that protein DNA interactions play in controlling pathogenesis. Uh, so for example, if there's a, a trigger in the environment or in the human body or something that, that triggers a pathogenic response in an organism, how is that relayed to the DNA by DNA binding proteins and how do those proteins then trigger uh, the expression of genes involved in pathogenicity. So at the moment we're studying two organisms in that way. So we're studying something called enterotoxigenic E. coli, uh, which I think if you were going to get E. coli it would be the one you'd least want to get. So that, that's abbreviated to ETEC. And we're also starting to study uh, Vibrio cholerae in that way, so the organism that causes cholera. Um, and in particular for cholera, we're interested in the switch between the aquatic environment, where cholera, well, the bacterium that causes cholera normally lives, uh, and the human body, when all of a sudden it produces all these nasty pathogenicity factors. And then the most recent uh, area that we've started to, got to get into is it's uh, the regulation of antibiotic resistance. Uh, so in many bacteria, uh, you can get uh, kind of breakdowns in the, the cellular response to stress and it can become deregulated. And uh, these are kind of like very robust bacterial cells. They're resistant to all sorts of stresses. So we're interested in understanding that process at the level of genes and interactions of proteins with the DNA to try and work out, if we can, uh, ways of getting around problems associated with antibiotic resistance. So at the moment, those are our three research themes. So today I'm gonna to focus on the very uh, fundamental aspects of genes and their control. Uh, and I'm gonna try and argue that some very, very well-established uh, ideas around genes and the control of genes have kind of started, they're so widely accepted that they've biased the way in which we think about the way in which genes work and we've become blinkered to other possibilities. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that for certain sets of genes, uh, they can deviate quite substantially from these very well characterized uh, molecular mechanisms of gene control. Uh, and that by understanding these hidden complexities, we can start to to get major insights into various aspects of bacterial biology. So what I'm going to talk about are, are genes that have been incorporated into bacterial chromosomes by horizontal gene transfer, so perhaps uh, by the action of a phage, something like this. So genes that have come from elsewhere. And these genes are often quite conspicuous because they have uh, different uh, not so much different DNA sequences, but they incorporate uh, different bases with a greater or less frequency than the genomic DNA background. And what we've found is that this gives these genes some very strange properties. And we've kind of known for a while that these genes behave in a strange way, but we've never really understood the fine details of, of why they give odd results uh, and so on. And essentially what we've found is that the the traditional view is that if you've got a, a unit of, of DNA that makes a gene, when the cell reads that DNA, it's like a, a book, you know, it reads it from cover to cover to produce a complete product that the cell can then use to, to make a protein. And what we think happens with lots of these horizontally acquired genes is that actually, because of their unusual DNA sequence properties, the cell almost doesn't know where to start reading the book and it makes lots of false starts in unusual locations. And we think that that makes these particular sections of DNA very poisonous to the cell. And that's got implications for uh, genome evolution and so on that are quite interesting. 
our current ideas are, are all based on uh, the Nobel Prize winning work of Jacob and Monod from the 1960s, you know, and they first came up with the idea that bacterial genes are organised into groups called operons and that the, the operons are transcribed as a single RNA that then gets translated to make proteins and so on. And, and that is, you know, that's, they won the Nobel Prize, that's clearly the case and it can explain a lot of what we understand. Uh, but, but for these particular genes, we, we just started to, you know, you, you, every so often you get a result that you can't explain in the lab and, and the tendency is to think, well, there's just something wrong with the experiment. And we get so blinkered by, you know, this is the way that genes work. And so if the data don't fit, then there must be something wrong with the data because that's not the way that it works. And, and we got some of these results and uh, I think through some chats with colleagues and, and so on, we thought, well, we'll just, we'll just have a look. And what we found was that the signal in the DNA that tells the cell to start reading the DNA from that point within these particular genes just occurs everywhere. So it normally occurs at the start of a gene or a, a section of DNA that needs to be read, but in these particular genes they just occur all over the place because of their unusual sequence and that was just completely unexpected. Um, I think a lot of people probably still struggle or don't like to believe these these sorts of things because it's so different to what we've we've seen previously um, but hopefully they will find my evidence compelling. Oh well, it's it's kind of unbelievable um, you know because you you do science because you enjoy science and so if someone says you've, you've won a prize for doing something you enjoy, that's amazing. And then, of course, you look at the list of people that have won it in the past, you think, crumbs, that's a lot to live up to. Um, so it's, it's flattering, but very humbling and almost daunting, you know, when you look down and see the list of people that have won it in the past. Um, hopefully I can live up to expectations.